everybody, and welcome to Kelman's Corner. Our guest this week is Harold Gibson, successful businessman from Greenfield, and his son Kyle, having a terrific year pitching now for the Philadelphia Phillies. We'll be back with Harold after these words. This week is Harold Gibson, a very successful businessman from Greenfield, Gibson Surveying and Landscaping, and his son, Kyle, outstanding pitcher right now with the Philadelphia Phillies. He's been one of the best pitchers in baseball this year. Harold, how are you doing? Howard, thank you. We're doing fine. We're uh, having fun watching Kyle and, and his journey along the way this year, and uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun, a little different, not getting to travel as much as we used to uh, or used to doing, but we'll, we'll get back around to that in due time. Let's talk about Kyle as a young man. I first met you in 1997, giving a speech to the Hancock County Home Builders, and you came up to me and said, I'd like you to speak to my son's baseball team, the base, the uh, Bandits. And uh, tell us about that and how that, that team, the Bandits Club, and how that influenced Kyle and helped his career at a young age. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up, Howard. And um, it, it really was just a, a plan that 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 I couldn't have dreamed up by myself. And the Lord had a lot to do with that. And it basically stemmed from the fact that uh, we were uh, uh, involved in our, our, our Little League program. And I was a Little League dad, you know, coaching my son. And there was just a lot of controversy and a lot of drama with each game you went to. And we were... Uh, training out at Rob Barber and Jeff Bursar's training facility in, in Greenfield. And um, it just so happened that we made a decision, myself and some friends of ours, that we were going to put together our own team. And we were just going to be uh, our own team and find our own people to play. And Rob uh, was gracious enough to let us build a field. And local bank was gracious enough to loan us some money. And some parents chipped in. And next thing you know, we have a field built. And we had eight eight or so basketball players that wanted to play baseball. And uh, we found four others and we put together a team. And the next thing you know, we have a team and we needed to find some people to play though, because at that time, you know, Little League had charters and you couldn't play in or out of that. So other people wouldn't play us. So we found some uh, independent teams like ours and uh, uh, the rest is history. So we, we, uh, we found out the first thing that as eight year olds, you play real baseball. And there were teams out there that did lead offs and hold runners on and a little bit bigger field. And it was just real baseball. You didn't have a set of rules that, that brought the game down. Uh, so you played what you watched on TV and the kids love that. Uh, so we had an early start at that. Uh, first year was a little bit of a struggle as you might expect, but we quickly adapted. And um, uh, so looking back on that, that was uh, 20, what, uh, 1996, uh, 25 years or so ago. Uh, maybe my mask a little wrong, whatever it is. Uh, it's been a fun ride, though. Well, it's been wonderful. And I met Kyle when I spoke at the Bandits Baseball Banquet in, uh, I think it was late 97 or early 98. He was 10 years old. And he said to me, I want to be a major league pitcher. And I said, I, I said, well, good luck. And I thought to myself, yes, and so does 60 million other children your age, too. But the incredible thing is, he made it. And let's talk, Harold, about those years growing up, getting to, and then he went to high school at Greenfield Central and so forth. Let's talk about those years and how he developed. Well, Howard, it was big for us to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, just really we were, we were coaching life. As I told you, we were trying to get away from an environment that wasn't very family friendly. It was too competitive. It was about a lot of egos. It was about the adults instead of the kids. So the first thing we were doing is we were just trying to teach life. So we, we brought 12 families and then expanded to four or five other teams. So we went from four, uh, 12 families to 60 families pretty quick. And um, what we tried to do was talk about the little things that make big differences. Uh, you know, not trying to be negative, trying to be positive, trying to put uh, the reality of what losing means and what failure means, because there's a lot of that in this game. In fact, you and I know that's really what this game is about. How do you deal with it? And um, we talked about being our best that we could be, not necessarily the best team, uh, not the best individual, but the best we can be. So we talked a lot, a lot of those things. And um, 
we tried to instill that in our players. We tried to instill that in our families. It was about a lot of a commitment. We had our players into the community trying to raise money, talking to them about how important it was if you're going to go out there and ask people to put their names on a sign, how important it was to respect that person, that they're reflected in what we're doing. So there was a lot of life being taught. And I think that uh, I'd like to think that um, what, what we did in those younger days has not only helped Kyle, but helped all those other kids that, and families and adults that we had in the club. Uh, there were a lot of learning moments for myself. In fact, if I could do it again, I, I'd do some things different. I probably blew things out of perspective, Howard, that weren't important at the time. <laughs> Imagine that, a young baseball coach blowing things out of perspective, you know. So um, we met a lot of great people along our way, just like yourself, Howard. There's been a lot of people involved in Kyle's journey, and everybody's got a part in it. Um, there's a lot of great people in baseball. There really is. And Kyle graduated from Greenfield Central. He was taken in the draft by the Phillies, although he wasn't a high draft pick. And I remember arranging for C.J. Nitkowski, who at the time was pitching for the Indianapolis Indians, to speak with you. And should Kyle go to college or should he sign? Uh, you probably remember talking to C.J., I would think. I, I do remember talking to one of the players, and I forget which one it was, so I appreciate you reminding me that, but – um, th there were some influences and some advices and some opinions and, uh, Kyle, Kyle did his own research. And I remember him telling me uh, a couple of weeks after he made the decision to go to college, cause there was not an, his dad wasn't very happy at that point in time. Um, so I said, Kyle, you just got to tell me, why did you choose to go to college? He goes, well, dad, my goal is to be a major league baseball pitcher. And my best path to getting to be in the major leagues is to go through college and mature and then I'll have a better chance of making it. And I, I think that was the advice he was given from most people, Howard. And it was very good advice. And obviously, you got to stay healthy. And uh, we've been very blessed to do that. So he goes to Missouri. And then after his junior year, he's drafted by the Minnesota Twins. Take us back to that moment when he was taken in the first round by the Twins. Well, that was the most stressful day of my life, I think. Uh, you know, Kyle was, uh, Kyle was projected to be picked very, very high. Uh, we were getting calls from people that may have gotten to pick second and third. But coming out of college, he had a stress fracture in his forearm. Nobody knew that until we went and got the MRIs. But we did the right thing. We went and got the MRI. We just distributed it to all the teams. And once the teams found that he had that stress fracture, he kind of fell. So uh, our advisor was with us. We had a big party going on. And MLB TV was there. And uh, – you know, we were going to get picked eighth. We were going to get picked 14th. We were going to get picked 16th. And those, those picks came and gone. And I was starting to just go crazy, Howard. I really was. And uh, I was inside talking to my advisor because he'd just gotten a call from the Cardinals or somebody that said, hey, if Kyle's there on the 24th, 25th pick, we're going to take him. Is that okay? And all of a sudden, I hear this huge uproar outside. And that's when the twins had picked him 21st uh, and uh, we ran outside and it was just elation. And I was very, very thankful that uh, the twins had enough confidence in him and uh, the Lord had a plan. It was perfect. So. And his path to the big leagues did get interrupted when he had Tommy John surgery. Yeah, it did. Um, he actually, his last game that he pitched was in Indianapolis in 2010 when he was triple a and uh he made it through five innings. He was hurting. He knew he was. Um, but um, after the game, he, he told me he was hurting. And, and we went and got the test. And he had surgery a couple months later. And, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's worked. We'll have more with Harold Gibson after these messages. first team that Kyle Gibson pitched for Harold in the big leagues obviously was the Twins. What was his experience like pitching for the Twins in Minnesota? Uh, Howard, he loved it. He loved the, the organization. He loved the team. He loved the players. Um, you know, he got to play under uh, Coach Molitor and then uh, Rocco Baldelli came in. He's had great pitching coaches. He's just had great teammates and I, I, he was disappointed to get traded. He would like to have stayed at Minnesota, but if there's a baseball business that he's come to understand and 
it's different than it was probably 30 or 40 years ago, but um, he, he loved the city. He got to make great friends up there. He got to do some great things. And um, I'm sure if he was sitting here, he'd tell you he wishes them nothing but the best. And he's going to hold them very, very high in his, uh, his appreciation list as, as, as he goes through life. I'm sure he'll go back there sometime. Well, he pitched there for several years and did well and then signed a beautiful contract with the Texas Rangers prior to the 2020 season, a multi-year contract. Yeah, that was, uh, that was an exciting time. He, he was, uh, it was around Thanksgiving when all those deals start flying around and he was calling me and saying, Hey, this team called me, this team called me, this team called me. But really what drove that decision, Howard was his, his, uh, his, uh, UC colitis that, um, ulcerative colitis condition that he has that uh, has really sidetracked him that last year in Minnesota. And the twins just did a wonderful job with him, giving him a chance, knowing how sick he was, giving him a chance to be part of the team, uh, to be part of the playoffs. And we're so thankful for that. But he drove a decision uh, to where he wanted to go. And this year, his second year with the Rangers, he gets the nod to be the opening night pitcher, which is a <laughs> pitching opening day is a wonderful honor. It really is. And he's had a phenomenal season, which we'll get to in a moment, but things did not go well for him on opening day. No, opening day was just an anomaly, Howard. Uh, he gave up. Well, he goes into the bottom of the first in Kansas City up five to nothing, and you think, all right, this is pretty good. And lo and behold, 10 minutes later, it's tied up five to five. Uh, so both starting pitchers give up a lot of hits. And uh, I think Kyle, looking back on that, he, he was a little too amped up. I have noticed in Kyle's starts when he gets too amped up, and that's one of the things guys have to learn to deal with, right? Um, he, he just has a chance of not commanding. He, he doesn't command his pitches as well. And he walked uh, Perez and uh, I, I forget who else. Oh, Solar. He walked those two guys. Uh, looking back on it in the first inning, those should not have been walks. They should have challenged them. And, uh, but, you know, hey, we live and learn. We talked about failure. And, uh, look, uh, he has a, a, the, worst, the worst game of his career. Uh, is the first game of this year, and now he's having the best game of his career. And hopefully he can talk to some young kids about that someday and um, uh, explain to them that it's it's just not that that defines you, you know? So, Well, well he's been of, one of the best pitchers in baseball this year and would be a Cy Young candidate, except he changed leagues when he got traded to the Philadelphia <laughs> Phillies. Well, uh, you know, those, those honors are obviously very, very special, but um, – you know, we're just happy that Kyle's getting to uh, to do what he loves to do. Uh, he's trying to make a difference in communities. He's, he's surrounded by some great people, some great players, and uh, just a chance to go play in a playoff atmosphere is, is really pretty thrilling for him. And uh, the, the person that's the most stressful on is Elizabeth. You know, Elizabeth has to move in a matter of hours, and she's got three kids she's got uh, to, to uh, bring along, and they got to find housing and things. So uh, they're settling in. Well, I think that you and and Kyle and the family handled it well because the word was he was going to get traded and it went on for days. And I remember texting with you and saying, Harold, my thoughts are with you. And you said something to the effect, look, this isn't the worst thing in the world. You know, something's going to happen. And I thought you really kept great perspective. Yeah. Well, thank you, Howard. It's, you know, th this is baseball and, uh, you know, you've got to be versatile. You got to be ready to make a decision and change and you got to, you got to adjust. Kyle is learning that he has to adjust within innings. Kyle has to learn he has to adjust within batters. And I think he would go back and tell you in that Kansas City game, he didn't make adjustments quick enough in that first inning. Harold, he's not been good. He's been outstanding this year, having the best year of his career at 33 years old. I know confidence plays a big part in it, but give us your thoughts as to why Kyle has gone from a good pitcher to really being a great pitcher this year. Uh, it's maturity. It's mental confidence. Uh, Howard, you've said it best. There's, it's, it's mental confidence. Um, you've got to be able to let go what just happened. You, you've got to be able to let go that last game. You can't be thinking about what, who's on deck. Um, Kyle has been told by many people to just trust his stuff. Now, that's easy to say, but you've got Albert Pujols up there. You've got whoever up there. Uh, you, you got Salvador Perez up there. And yeah, I've got to take my sinker and I've got to start it down the middle of the plate. And I got to know that it's going to sink out of the zone. And, and that's what it means. I know he told me earlier in the year, 
He goes, Dad, I feel like I can take any pitch right now and throw it to the middle of the plate, and I'm going to be okay. He's had that ability to do that over the years past, but he hasn't. He's kind of felt like he's had to almost trick guys a little bit, but the ball has to stay in the zone long enough that hitters are going to think it's a strike. If it starts a ball, they are not swinging. It's got to start a strike, and it's got to stay a strike for a while. Now, if that sinker doesn't sink, I remember his mom asked him early in his career, hey, Kyle, what happens if you start you throw a sinker and it doesn't sink? And I loved Kyle's reaction. He goes, well, mom, I'm getting another ball from the umpire because that one's a souvenir. <laughs> so, and that's the reality, though, right? But if, if, if I throw my pitch thinking that it's not going to sink, it's going to be a ball early, and it's going to be in the dirt, and the batter's not going to swing. I've got to throw it and have conviction that it's going to be what it's supposed to be. And it's going to move, and it's going to do what it's supposed to do, and it's going to end up where it's supposed to end. Um, and you, you, you just got to trust your stuff. How does he feel pitching in Philadelphia? It's a National League park. It's a hitter-friendly ballpark, which presents some challenges. And those fans are pretty intense in Philadelphia. Well, no, no disrespect to Minnesota or Texas, but Sharon and I were blessed enough to go to his first game that he pitched in Philadelphia. We were able to find some help. We made the trip. That was the most exciting atmosphere we've ever been in, uh, not including all of them. Um, the fans are awesome. They're into every pitch. They know the situation. Uh, these players feed off of that. Kyle will tell you that pitching in the empty stadiums in the COVID wasn't, it just wasn't right, you know? Um, but but um, he loves it. Um, it's, comp it's competition. Um, it challenges you to be, be your best. And um, you know what? They're professional players. They're supposed to perform. And when they, when they don't perform, um, they can handle it. And uh, they should be ready to uh, be accountable for that. But um, it, it's a great atmosphere, Howard. I, I hear all these stories about the fans, but I'm telling you, I, I, I love it. I, I thought it was good. He likes it. Does he try to take the same approach if he's pitching in a hitter-friendly ballpark or, and Colorado would be the extreme example of a hitter-friendly ballpark with the way the ball carries, that he does if he's in, say, pitching in Los Angeles against the Dodgers in a pitcher-friendly park? Yeah, Kyle, Kyle's going to throw to his strengths. You know, and his strengths is sinker balls, and he's going to try to get you to hit ground balls, and um, he's going to try to react to what you, the hitter, are doing. And if you're trying to lift it, he has tried to be more up in the zone this year. Uh, that was a hard adjustment for him to make, to try to throw that high fastball. Um, you know, you practice sinker ball, sinker ball, sinker ball for years after year. You just can't come in and say, oh, I need to throw a letter high fastball now. It doesn't work that way. So, um, no, he, he pitches the same way, whether he's home or away on the road, hitter friendly, pitcher friendly. His strength. That's terrific. It's one thing to say I'm going to do that. It's another thing to do that because a lot of pitchers don't do that. Yeah, it's you, that's what the bullpen days are for, and that's what that offseason's for. And it takes a while if you're going to make an adjustment. Kyle made some adjustments this past fall, this past winter. Um, he went to the baseball factory in Florida where they've helped him for a couple of years. And uh, video and technology is important when you're looking at that. He made some mechanical adjustments, which he's liked. And uh, th that's been another reason, along with his confidence, that he's had a good year. And the Phillies are in contention. I believe they're about four games above 500, so they have a shot at getting in the postseason. Yeah, it's exciting. Sharon and I are watching Kyle and the Phillies play, and then we're watching games afterwards and, uh, you know, trying to keep track of things. And, you know, parents scoreboard watch, too, just like players do. So <laughs> Announcers do, too, sometimes on every pitch. Um, so how has that announcing been for you this year? It's got to be different not being at the park. I, I just, well, how do you do that? I am for the home games. Yeah, but the, the away home games, games are, how do you, right. How do you make it, those it's calls, much right? different. Yeah. It's, it's much different. I'm working off a monitor at Victory Field for the away games. It presents some challenges, but you have to adapt and adjust. Look, baseball's a game of adjustments. Yeah. And I'm not the only announcer doing this. Most announcers in the big leagues are not traveling either. So, and are working in an office studio or a feet at the ballpark. So, it presents some challenges. We do look at the uh, home plate screen, so we tend to second-guess umpires a little more than we normally would. Well, uh, 
Th that needs to happen. You know, I'm still an old fashioned coach, so we still need to question umpires, but that can't be as exciting an environment for you, just like the players, not being on the road, not being there at the game and having to call the game. That, that has to be a different feel. It is different, but again, whatever situation you're in, you make the most of, and you also have to realize a lot of people lost a lot of money last year and because of COVID. And, yeah. and so uh, I understand from the Indians' perspective and other teams' perspective, why we're doing this in this particular situation. Harold, it's it's absolutely wonderful spending time with you. You've been a great friend over the years, as has Kyle. And we wish Kyle the very best. We're into September now, and maybe the Phillies can get in the postseason. Well, Howard, thank you. I apologize that I regret that we haven't been able to get out to see the Indians play much, but I appreciate the invitations. I appreciate you having me on. I love what you do, and um, looking forward to uh, another time with you in the future. Same here. That's Harold Gibson. We'll have more after these words. Thanks to our guest, Harold Gibson. See you next week, everybody.